Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Stanford University uh, here in California. Will it be the climate scientists who save the world? Well, we've got two in our studio today. Mark Jacobson is with us, professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, director of its atmosphere energy program. Uh, professor Jacobson is also co-founder of the Solutions Project, and that's what we're going to talk about next, solutions. Noah Diffenbaugh is also with us, senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, associate professor in environmental earth uh, system science. Uh, so let's go back to April, when California Governor Jerry Brown ordered residents to cut their water use by 25 percent. We're in a historic drought, and that demands unprecedented action. For that reason, I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reduction across our state. As Californians, we have to pull together and save water in every way we can. People should realize we're in a new era. Uh, the idea of your nice little green grass getting lots of water every day, uh, that's going to be a thing of the past. When Governor Brown announced new water restrictions for California, he acknowledged the role of global warming, saying, quote, the reality is that climate is getting warmer, the weather is getting more extreme and unpredictable, and we have to become more resilient, more efficient, and more innovative. I want to turn to comments now from President Obama when he visited California last year to announce new federal aid to help the drought-stricken state. Scientists will debate whether a particular storm or drought reflects patterns of climate change. But one thing that is undeniable is that changing temperatures influence drought in at least three ways. Number one, more rain falls in extreme downpours, so more water is lost to run off than captured for use. Number two, more precipitation in the mountains falls as rain rather than snow, so rivers run dry earlier in the year. Number three, soil and reservoirs lose more water to evaporation year-round. What, what does all this mean? Uh, unless and until we do more to combat carbon pollution that causes climate change, this trend is going to get worse. That's President Obama saying we need to do more. Um, Professor Mark Jacobson, you have just released a state-by-state um, plan for what needs to be done, what needs to be done? Well, our plans are to change the energy infrastructure of each and every state in the United States, and in fact, ultimately, every country of the world, to infrastructures run entirely on wind, water, and solar power for all purposes. So that's electricity, transportation, heating and cooling, and industry. I mean, right now, fossil fuels and nuclear power and biofuels are powering our energy infrastructure for all purposes. And these, the emissions associated with the burning of the fuels primarily, burning of fossil fuels and biofuels in particular, these emissions are causing both air pollution and global warming. And these are almost entirely the cause of both these problems. I mean, air pollution causes four to seven million premature deaths each year worldwide, including about 62,000 in the United States and about 12,000 in California. And global warming, of course, is a growing and rising problem. In terms of costs, the air pollution mortality in, in the United States alone cost the United States about $500 billion per year, or 3 percent of the GDP of the U.S. And in 2050, it's estimated that U.S. emissions alone will cause $3.3 trillion of global climate damage, and the rest of the world will cause a you know, total of about 15 to $20 trillion per year of damage. And so we're trying to the, — the only way to solve this problem is to change the energy infrastructure. That's to electrify everything, pretty much, and produce that electricity from clean energy, such as wind, water, and solar power. So how do you do that? Well, in our plans, we do it state by state. and. And we say, first develop a plan. We say, this is, like, how many wind turbines do we need? How many solar panels do we need? You know, how much rooftop areas do we have? Uh, how much land area do we require, require? What would be the cost? How much storage do we need? Um, how many jobs are, would be created as a result? And it would, in the United States, create a net of about 2 million jobs to do such a transformation. And then we — once we've developed a plan, then we educate the public about the plans, educate policymakers, and try and hope that 
people will then take these plans and run with them and actually start implementing these changes. I want to go through some different states with you. But first, California lawmakers have just approved a dozen ambitious environmental and energy bills creating new standards for energy efficiency. Dubbed the California Climate Leadership Package, the 12 bills set high benchmarks for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and petroleum use. State Senate leader uh, Kevin DeLeon explained one of the cornerstones of the program, SB 350, which calls for a 50-50-50 reduction in major areas of climate concern. Now is the time to keep the momentum going. Clean tech companies in California are creating more jobs and are investing more money than competitors in any other state. We need to pursue policies that build on this economic growth by strengthening incentives for energy efficiency and clean technology. The Golden State Standards, 50 percent less petroleum use, 50 percent electricity coming from renewable sources, and 50 percent better energy efficiency in our buildings. Uh, that's Senate Leader Kevin DeLeon. Uh, Mark Jacobson, uh, what needs to happen in California? Then go across the country, where I just came from, from New York, and talk about what needs to happen there. Well, in California, actually, a lot has been happening. Uh, Governor Brown in January actually announced that the state will go 50 percent renewable, mostly wind, water, and solar power, by 2030. Uh, we had proposed 80 percent by 2030 conversion and 100 percent by 2050. So Governor Brown, uh, his proposal for 50 percent by 2030 is 60 percent of what we think is needed. Uh, but the Senate of California just uh, within the last two days actually advanced that proposal and approved a 50 percent by 2030 conversion uh, for most sectors of the energy economy. Uh, but we need really aggressive measures. I mean, we can't just, you know, have small changes. I mean, there are changes going on. I mean, right now, Iowa, South Dakota, they have 30 percent almost of the, all their electric power from wind. Uh, but we need to change not only electricity, but transportation, heating, cooling, and industry. And electricity is only on the order of 20 percent of total energy uh, anywhere. And But states are making progress. I mean, New York has made progress in uh, by implementing some policies that would get us towards a closer to a renewable economy. But — and there are some states, like Washington State, that already have, a, like, 73 percent of their electricity is already from clean energy, mostly because they have a lot of hydroelectric there. Uh, but we need much more aggressive measures, because uh, the, you know, the Arctic sea ice is expected to disappear within anywhere from 10 to 30 years, and that would cause positive feedbacks that would accelerate climate change. So we can't wait, you know, 20 years for some new energy technologies to come around. We need to use existing technologies today, implement them, and get the ball rolling in terms of the transition. People still raise their eyebrows when you say windmills, when you say solar panels, that these yeah. are the solutions. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of kind of false uh, beliefs about renewable energy. But things have changed. I mean, wind is right now not only one of the fast between wind and solar are the fastest growing new source of electric power in the United States but wind is actually the cheapest form of electricity by far in the United States today the unsubsidized cost without the subsidies is about 3.7 to 5 cents per kilowatt hour and you know subsidies are another like one and a half cents to drop those costs lower per kilowatt hour. But that compares with natural gas, which is six to eight cents per kilowatt hour. So wind is one half the cost of natural gas. Utility scale solar is about the same as natural gas now. It's also around six to eight cents per kilowatt hour unsubsidized. Mark, I wanted to turn to <clears throat> um, a cartoon that uh, you were recently featured in called Tommy Toon, Tommy Time. Um, which seeks to raise awareness about renewable energy. In this clip, Tommy, who's played by Mark Ruffalo, asks you why your home is the only one on the block that withstood a power outage. Tell me, Professor J, magic man, why are your lights the only ones on on the block? Conspiracy? In the case of grid failure, my friend, my inverter switches to off-grid mode, drawing power from my solar array and backyard wind turbine that is stored in batteries. <laughs> Powered by wind, water, and sun. There you have it. Um, so, <clears throat> explain what you were telling Tommy Time. Well, it turns out, like, you know, people today can actually control their own power in, in their own homes. Uh, you know, you can put solar panels. I mean, wind turbines maybe only in a few locations in your backyard, uh, but you can 
combine solar panels on your rooftops with batteries in uh, the Tesla has a new battery pack that uh, you can put in your garage that can that where you can store electricity uh, during the day that from the solar and then use it use that electricity when there are peak times of electricity because that's when the prices of electricity are much higher uh, but people can do other things like they can weatherize their home they can use energy efficient appliances uh, there are a lot of things that people can do to reduce energy use and go towards 100 percent renewable energy um, using heat pumps instead of gas heaters uh, getting electric cars instead of gasoline cars uh, so, so what have you done at home uh, myself, actually, I did electrify my entire home starting in 2005. Uh, I put solar panels on the roof, got an electric car, switched out the gas heaters for water and air for electric uh, heat pumps, and uh, and also then got energy efficient appliances. Uh, so I tried to, you know, do what I what I talk about, uh, and I and I realized actually since 2005, between 2005 and 2013, that I, I never paid an electricity bill. Or and then when I bought an electric car, I never paid another gas bill. And then I, when I got my gas heaters, I never, uh, I never paid for gas. So anymore. what's the simplest way for people to do it at home? And people who live in apartments, apartment buildings. Well, anybody can use energy efficient light bulbs, appliances, can weatherize their home. It's, that's pretty low cost. Uh, there for. Solar used to be more expensive now for rooftops. Now it's, the price has gone down, but actually 80 percent of solar right now is leased. And so you don't have to put up an upfront cost for it. You can just pay basically like you do an electricity bill for solar that's, that's clean. So you're pushing for renewables, getting off fossil fuel. <clears throat> what do you think of the divestment movement? Stanford University just announced that it's divesting from coal, coming from enormous pressure from especially students. There's a movement across the country and around the world right now on this issue. I was just at Cambridge University in Britain, uh, Oxford students and professors as well. Yeah, well, divestment is one way to do a transition. I mean, there, there are a lot of policy options that are possible. And divestment is where, you know, universities, but also companies or individuals will take uh, money out of fossil fuels and maybe shift them to clean, renewable energy sources. And so that will help in the transition. And we don't advocate, because we should just focus on the science, but we don't advocate specific policies. But that's certainly one that would be effective in some degree. <clears throat> Before we wrap up, I want to play the comment of um, Pennsylvania's former Senator Rick Santorum, who launched a second bid for the Republican presidential nomination in January. He told CNN host Michael Smirkonish he recognizes the climate is warming, but questioned whether humans are causing it or whether to take action to address it. Is there anything the United States can do about it? Clearly, no. I, even folks who uh, who accept all of uh, the uh, the science by the uh, alarmists on the other side recognize that everything that's being considered by the United States will have almost well, not almost, will have zero impact on it, given what's going on. In so, the is rest your of the answer world. do so, nothing? Uh, again. Well, the answer is it, it do something. If it has no impact, of course, do nothing. Why would you do something for the and and with the ad, with the with people admitting that even if you do something, it won't make a difference. Well, that is one of the Republican presidential hopefuls, um, Rick Santorum. Uh, Noah Diffenbaugh, as we wrap up now, what is your answer to him? He says do nothing if it's not going to make a difference. Well, the thing about the climate system is it's connected globally. And we've actually looked, we've asked this question, what if the developed world, what if the EU and the U.S. did nothing and the rest of the world looks like us? What if the rest of the world, if we have a world of 9 billion people that look like me? What that means for most of the U.S. is what used to be the hottest summer that anyone ever experienced happens 75 percent of the time. So we're tremendously exposed to what happens around the world. And it's true that the scale of the problem is enormous. And the kinds of you know, innovations that Mark's talking about in his home, the kind of innovations we're seeing here at Stanford, here in California, uh, that's what we need in order to radiate out to the whole world in order to make this transition. If we don't make this transition, we're going to have a lot of climate change. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us, uh, Noah Diffenbaugh and Mark Jacobson, both climate scientists here at Stanford University. We'll continue to follow your work and link to your reports. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, the first female mayor of Barcelona. Stay with us.